Okay, welcome back to Triumphant Media. Today we have Cheryl Atwood from Domestic Violence to the Boardroom. We're gonna talk about a few things. Um, put your seat belts on, get in the chat and ask some questions. We will answer those at the end. Um, again, I'm gonna explain Triumphant Media and why we're here. Triumphant Media is basically put together to bring a positive spin to our neighborhoods. Um, we get a lot of negative feedback. The media, once we do something uh, wrong, it seems like the whole community looks like that. Our kids wanna be basketball players, rappers, entertainers only. Um, when we have people in the corporate boardroom, we have people that are lawyers, we have people, we have, we have a president. So there are other things that we can do to do tremendous and marvelous things. And that's what triumphant media is about. So Cheryl, how are you? Hi. I am better than good. Better good. than good. Good, good, good. I thank you for lending me some of your time because I know your time is very valuable. And I appreciate you uh, spending some time with me to talk about what you do, what you've, uh, how, you've, how, how you've gotten here. And uh, so just to start off, kind of tell the people uh, a little bit about what you do as far as your corporate life. My corporate life. So thank you, Tony, for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to share my story and to impact another um, set of audiences. My daily, my nine to five, I work for a Fortune 500 company where I'm responsible for a lot of the um, contract management and negotiations and drafting of the inner workings. Uh, and I'm being very topical specifically. Uh, so um, we're... Uh, I have a lot of responsibility and I manage a team of approximately 12, 12 people. Nice, nice, nice. So we've got, we've got a, 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 how they say in the corporate world, a 300 foot view of the, uh, of what you do. <laughs> yes, that was the aerial view. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. So let's, uh, let's go into a couple of questions here. The okay. first question that I have for you is, it's, it's, it's something that I just made up, so forgive me. What one thing would you do to change the world? If you could do one thing to change the world, what would that one thing be? Um, that's an interesting question. One thing I would, if I could change, um, I would eliminate prejudice and bias. I think today we're in a climate where no one takes the time to learn each other, understand each other. Everybody just wants to be heard, but nobody wants to, nobody's trying to understand. So I think that's one area that I would really like to change where we just level the playing field, stop trying to be right about things, stop having preconceived notions about a person before um, understanding their experiences. Um, and just, just, just more love. I can't, I can't stand the divisive spirit right now. <laughs> so. None of that. The divisive spirit. Okay, so now that you said divisive spirit, so I got to just go. Uh, where, where, where we at religiously? Like, where, where, where do you stand? So just we can get that out the way. My faith is the primary importance to me. Without it, I would not have a message. Without it, I wouldn't be here today. And my story is definitely a part of God's redemption. And I, I stay close to it because if I don't, I, I need him as, I need my God to be a part of my life and every element of my life. And I don't take it lightly. Um, and some, sometimes people find it hard to understand because of who I used to be. And there are people that are more comfortable with who I used to be and don't really embrace who I am. But I'm okay with that because my relationship with God is first. This relationship is first right? and then everything else is second. Nice, nice, nice. People forget that. They, they forget the vertical relationship. They only think about the horizontal relationship and that's a whole different uh, topic, but, but that's, that's good stuff. Um, so another broad, crazy question, right? Okay. Just to get us loosened up. Crazy, crazy okay, all right, I'm getting loosed up. <laughs> if you could break your, your your life into three segments, right? Like let's say like five to eighteen was a segment, eighteen to this was a segment, uh, twenty to 
25 to 35 was a segment. What would each segment, what would you, what would you give one word for each segment? Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and that's a great uh, question, the evolution of myself. Um, from, I think, zero from birth to about nine years old, um, free. I, I was free. From age nine, because of my experiences, to age, um, I would say about... 29 to 30 lost wow from 30 to 40 found from 40 on awareness nice free loss found awareness all right yeah. love that um where did you grow up pardon me where did you grow up I grew up in um, a small town called Godridge, Ontario. Um, I was born in Jamaica. I oh. left Jamaica when I was three and we rightfully came to Canada. Um, a beautiful little town, 7,000 people. And I grew up there with my brothers and brother and sisters. <laughs> um, what's your fondest memory of that place? You know, I, I think I really enjoyed the no responsibility. <laughs> <Just the freedom. laughs> I would say I, I, I took for granted, you know, just being able to live my life. I love the freedom of my youth and maybe even the naive, not being naive too, because it allowed me to see things as they are, right. um, as I wanted them to see and not really look deeper. So I really like the innocence of the youth, of my, my youth. That's what I really miss there. And I think the family connections, because as you grow older, we all have different goals and different, um, mm -hmm. have different ambitions. And right. it kind of just pulls away. We had a really close knit family. Right. And the older we get, it's almost like we we're, we're, we separate. We still have our nucleus. We still have our my parents, but it's just it's just harder to feel that family unit now that we're older. Right. Everybody starts branching out to their to do their own thing. Yeah. Nice. I, I understand that. Um, <clears throat> here's a here's a question. Uh, your fondest memory of your mom. Your fondest memory of your dad. Uh, <laughs> um. My mom is, uh, I feel that I have the best qualities from each of them. Okay. My husband might say something different. <laughs> but I, 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 uh, my mother is very giving. Uh, she loves to entertain. Um, and I really remember the times that uh, we were our parents' purse. They would never go anywhere if we couldn't go as a family. Oh, nice. so, so we were always, we always traveled as a unit. And so I, I really loved the experiences that they taught us the important of, importance of family. Okay. Uh, for my dad, my fondest moments are, he was just iconic, uh, uh, just a symbol of strength. And when I was, anytime I was around him, I felt protected right. that nothing could happen to me. Okay, so right. that family unit, the, the love was there, the strength of the father, the presence of the father, the protection of the father and the, the mother that's ready to serve and entertain. I, I have both of, I have the best of their qualities. <laughs> and and, I, and I, I love how that's translated into who I am today. Nice, nice, that's pretty solid. That is pretty solid. Um, so before we go deep, you know, to start deep diving, if you could have a conversation with the, with the younger self at any age, right now with all the knowledge you have, <laughs> what age would you pick and what would you say? I think I would go back to the time when I was pregnant. I was pregnant at a, a young age and I would say not to be hard on myself and I would say thank you for the lessons. Okay. Because um, it was from my experience that um, 
it's all my experiences have brought me to now. Right. So I'm grateful for that. I, I could have made different choices, but I'm grateful for my experiences uh, and, and how I've been able to turn my tears into transformation. Nice. Um, so let's stop there for a second. Um, Cause that's, that's pretty important. That's, I think that's pretty impactful. So you would go back and say to that, to that particular Cheryl, Hey, you're good. Don't worry about it. You wouldn't go back before and go, you know, I, I understand you love, you love your child, but you wouldn't go, Hey, be more careful and don't do it. You would just say, Hey, just be okay in the space. I would say, I, cause I can't, I can't, I try not to live in a position of the past. What could I, should I would have done? Right. I think what has happened, um, I don't blame God because God's given us, given us the freedom of choice right. and he's given us some sense of discernment and we can make that choice whether to, you know, go left or go right. I always went the way of adventure and risk <laughs> <laughs> because that's just my nature. Um, you can't tell me no without a reason because I'll find, I want to, I want to know the reason why, why no. Um, so I, I want to, I, I, I don't, I'm, I don't regret um, my experiences. I regret my choices. Okay. Nice. I, that, that's, I'm going to put a pin in that one. I like that one. I don't regret my experience. I regret my choices. Nice. That's a great one. Um, okay. So you just said something pretty interesting. Um, a lot of people get stuck in what they did in their past or what somebody did to them in their past, right? And we never look at how we contributed to whatever happened because at, in that moment, we had, like you said, we had a choice, right? Um, so it's pretty interesting you said that, it popped in my head. How, how do you help somebody negotiate through that? Like if you would sit down and talk to somebody, a young lady saying she's, she's going through a problem and how would you help her negotiate through? Because I, I believe healing begins when you can negotiate through where you made the mistake at and identify it. So how would you negotiate somebody through that? Because I think that's hard for people to do. Is it hard for someone? Because every, everyone has something that they have to make it through. You can stay in there, which serves a purpose, a victim mentality, I call it. Uh, you can stay there and not see uh, other, and, 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 and granted, some people don't have choices at the, the moment, but to sit in regret, to sit in the past is self-debilitating. Um, right. I always try and talk from a position of growth and healing, so I don't concentrate on my past as much as I concentrate on how I can continue to develop myself and continue to move forward and continue to impact others and to empower others to do the same. So I would probably sit down with someone and just say, identify what you regret. What steps do you have to take to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Implement the plan and then move forward. Right. Be actionable. Right, right. Okay, um, so let's dive right in. Um, so tell us what happened between nine and what did you say, 18? It's age nine to, I think I, we left at 13 when I was 13. Okay. So between those ages, I growing up in a small town, um, I was violated by a friend of the family. I was molested. Okay. That impacted, and that was something I never mentioned to my parents. And that's not something I never even processed. I just felt that I was in the wrong place. I could have done something else. Um, but, you know, as with any abuser or any pred uh, uh, predator, they always try and convince you that you're the wrong, that you're going to be the impetus for something breaking up the family and stuff. And as I said, our family was very close. So that was right. very right. significant. So that punctuated, that act punctuated a lot of bad decisions because I, st I didn't have, I didn't put clear boundaries around myself. And I allowed myself to become, um, I allowed people not to respect my space. I didn't have a space that was respected. 
So okay. needless to say, I fell into the wrong group of people because I, I always, I felt like I, I wanted this acceptance to make sure that I was okay. If they validate me, then I know that I'm okay. okay. And I didn't get that validation. I got that validation from, from this, this boy who I thought was everything. Uh, and then he ended up, you know, abusing me. Okay. So all my bad choices were punctuated from the molestation okay. and into the, and then it just kind of spiraled and I got into um, the wrong crowd, drugs, alcohol. Um, my life was out of control, Tony. If I say, if, if I, if I, if I um, say I was in control and I had a great time, I couldn't say that because the, the thing is I was raised in a Christian home. Okay. So I had foundational, um, I had a foundational basis to understand that my moral compass was out of alignment with where I was going. Okay. So when, when you have that foundation of faith and Christianity, it's something that you can't forget once it's, it's implanted in it. And so once I, I drank, I would remember I drink again to forget what I should remember. And right. it just, it became a cycle when the alcohol and the drugs were numbing okay. any of what I felt. So it, it wasn't working. So I can actually say there's even periods of my life that I don't remember because I had pacified it so much with alcohol and drugs. Like, and like sometimes I have little segments of, of, of uh, life segments that flash in my memory that I'm like, oh, I can remember, but I have clear memory from my childhood. Right. And then all of a sudden I have this blur and I just have moments that I remember and something, I don't know, moments or something else will trigger it, but I don't have a clear, if you ask me year by year and some people can, my mother's got a great memory. If you can itemize certain things chronologically, I get stuck somewhere because uh, it was, it, my life was a fog. Right. They, they do say that um, the resilience of children and the human brain, it, it, it kind of cuts off things that are traumatic, that it's super traumatic. That's one of the reasons why if you cut off a leg or arm, you just black out automatically because your body is shutting you down. And, and, and a lot of people don't understand that when you have a molestation or a violation like that, your, your brain cuts that off, it shuts It shuts that down. So anything after that, that might be a traumatic experience, even though if you if you said, um, okay, I'm gonna do this, but it's a traumatic experience, like, it's, like what you're saying is, you grew up in a Christian home, so you were outside the boundaries of what you grew up for, so right. your mind would go, no, we don't, need to, we, we don't need to think about that, we don't need to talk about that. So let me circle back for a second. What do you think would have happened if you had told your, told your parents what would happen to you? Well, if, if I go back now, talk from a position of understanding, you know, when I was younger, I didn't have that, that common sense to that extreme, but I believed the accuser. I don't know. I, I, I don't want to question how they would have reacted, what would have happened. I'm sure they would have been 100% behind me, but I don't know that as a child, right? No. I said it now, and my mother, when I did the play, she she actually asked me, is there anything that she could have done to reconcile it, to make it better? And right. I said to my mom, no, I'm, I'm, I'm over it. If you feel that you have to go back to this person, that's fine. I said, but just know that I'm already, I've gone through it. I've processed it. I've identified where I felt um, that I can do better. I've, I've forgiven and I'm in a different space. As I said, I don't, I don't stay in the pain because it does, it does no, it has no benefit to where right. I'm going in life. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. So I know we might be jumping ahead a little bit, like, but how long would it take you to get there? That that space to be like, that's that happened. There's nothing I can do about it. So let me proceed, forgive. And move on. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's it didn't, it's not it's not like I turned the page and said, OK, it was a process because I went through I went through a period where I was I was, as I said, lost. And um, I think I my my sister, my younger sister and I were really close friends. And she's the one that really talked me to go back into to go to school because I had dropped out of school. Wow. 
and um and I just I was just running the streets and yes, you know, doing everything. But I kept in close touch because I wanted to make sure that she didn't go through the things. I did my best to make sure that she did not have to experience the things that I went through. And I made sure that I, I let her know the things that I was going through or the things that I were doing. So she, if anybody knew me and what I was going through to a certain extent, because she didn't know everything was my little sister, but I did that for to protect her growing up because she had... She she was innocent right. and she was going she was going places. I was the one that was having fun. I was the rebellion. My parents, I'm sure, God bless them, thought that what is wrong with this child? What is what is wrong with this one? Right. Why right. can't she get it? But um I, I'm I'm glad I had a praying grandmother oh. that uh, really that really believed in me. Um and she's passed and I, I wish she could see where I am today. I'm pretty sure she's protecting you. Yeah, but, I really, I really do think Miss P is looking down at me. But, but I like, I like what you just went there. Um, as a parent, right? We, we sometimes have children who, who get wayward. Let's say wayward, right? Mm -hmm. And we wonder why, why I'm trying everything I can. I'm doing all of the steps that I believe I should be doing, but I can't grab. Like, I, there's something I can't grab. Right. So your parents didn't know that you particularly went through something that is the catalyst for why you're acting the way you're acting. Right. right. So so that's that's pretty interesting how. The, as much as they were trying because they didn't know the root cause, they could right. never reach what was going on. And that's absolutely right. They didn't understand the root cause. I think in hindsight now it they're connecting the dots and right. it, it makes sense. Um, uh, but I really believe that how my story was revealed was how it was supposed to be revealed. Um, when I wrote the play, I didn't even, they didn't know until I wrote the play. And I was sitting, my parents were sitting in front of me and I was too concerned looking at their faces than watching the play because they did not know what right. was in the play. And my dad, you know, my dad, what did he say to me? Um, I, I know we did the best we could, but I'm sure we could have done better. And, you know, I just, ah, you know, just tears running because that's that I think my biggest fear was that there would have been some rejection from that because it, it because he's a private man right? and family things and, you know, these kind of things are not, we were taught in the black community to shun, right? Okay. And we compress Yep. and we hide so this was a big step for me this one i became an open book and it was a huge step of faith but it's something that i did because i felt it necessary to tell my story because i was tired of walking around with a mask okay. um and pretending that i was okay um people thought oh she's got it all together she's got this and this and i was bruised and battered inside and i couldn't express that to people because people leaned on me as the person of strength and the one that can do this they can do this and there was nobody there that i could turn to and i and i allowed that i allowed that per perception to continue and exist well that's what most of us do we we put that mask on every day we go out and tell the world we're doing fine and now we got selfies and social media right. to say, hey hey look at me i'm on a yacht i'm in i'm in a nice car my right. life is great but um let, let's circle back I, I like what you said what, what we have to do talk about though since you brought it up so early and it's okay. it's great and i'm i'm cool with it the play you're talking about is wounded soul right, right? Yes. So, so just so our audience understands where we're going, because she's, I know that in their minds are like, play? What play? She did a play? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they will soon see that you're multi-talented. Um, so the play Wounded Soul is about your life. So take us through writing that. What was that like just to, to write that? Okay. So I, I it, the writing was um, cleansing for me because I, I, formulated the play's name around a poem I wrote uh, when I was younger called The Wounded Soul. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, it, that's where the title came from. And, and truthfully, I, I didn't know how much I was going to reveal. Uh, I just started writing and it was, it was, 
it was immediate. It, 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 didn't, it didn't take me like three weeks. I wrote that play um, and I stopped at a part and my husband's like, you have to continue because it started to, it started to bring about things. It brought up stories I didn't even want to think about that I didn't even write about. Right. And, and he's like, babes, you have to do this. Um, you have to write and go through it. And then when he said that, I just finished, finished writing the story. So with that, I had uh, two other people, a writing team that reviewed it because I want to make sure that, you know, what I tried to portray was something that um, it was understood what I was trying to, um, for the audience to relay the emotion of what is what I was trying to do. And, and every person that I gave to read it had the same reaction like they they thought it was very intense it was one of the it was a great story and it, it's how I had the soul talking to me in in retrospect looking at my life and you know just I it was a four-dimensional view of my life being told in one story and so I had it I, I was off Broadway in 2017 and then I did um an, another one in 2018 of the same story and I had the first the first theater that I did it in, after they saw the play, they're like, um, can you just maybe tone down that section a little bit? Uh, and I said, no, right. I, I, I'm not gonna do that because I don't want the play to be um, entertainment. Right. I want people to experience it. I wanted people to understand that this was a life and, and, and perhaps the way I write poetically is based on that's how I put words together to formulate emotion and and that came across strongly and so he he understood that because he said he could get me a writer that could maybe portray me like that but I don't like to be put in a box right. Right. um I I I believe art can be tested and it's not it's not between these four lines. I push boundaries all the time. Right. So it, it, it was okay for me to be uncomfortable. And I got good reviews from the play. And that's when the audience came to me as basically as a council. And they started telling me their stories, men and women, nice. about the abuse they suffered. And they said, you have to continue. You can't stop here. This right. place should be here. This place, I'll give you money so you can do it here. And I'm just, I, the support that I got was so genuine. So, so when it was done, I knew I had to do something else. Okay. 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 Um, so the play is not just about what happened to you as a little girl. It's also about what happened to you through those teenage to 30 years. Yes. So kind of weave that in so, so our audience can, can understand you know, what was going on at that, at that point as well. So as I said, the molestation um, punctuated my bad decision. So I met a guy that gave me the attention that I thought I needed um, and I became somebody he thought he, I should be. And, and I got you know introduced to a lifestyle of crime, drugs, and alcohol. Wow. Um, he, he held a job, but it was, it's sad. Our, the, his job was not the way he made a living. He made a living doing criminal activity. Okay. And so that's the atmosphere that I was in. And then the isolation came where, uh, back then they had the phones with the dial. Right. The rotary phones. Rotary phones. And he put a pin in it, so I couldn't call out. Wow. I could only get calls in. So the isolation started. I, you know, I see my family less and less because I moved out because, you know, my parents didn't know any better. This is the man that I needed to be with. Right. And, you know, I'm not going to listen. So there was friction there. But when I did come back, you know, I was sitting at the table. I had sunglasses on because my eye was like when I say hit, it wasn't like slap. It's I was like, like boxed, uh, knife kicked, bottle broken. I. I, I, it was, it was abuse, very, very abusive. And I remember one time, um, I thought I was dying and, um, I won't even mention his name cause I'm not even going to give him credit, but my ex, uh, he had me down in the corner. I came to my parents' house for something and he came with me and uh, he had my, I, like, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. And all of a sudden he flew off 
me and it, my dad came home for lunch my dad never comes home for lunch he's wow. old so he took him off me and then and that's when they became aware um i'm sure they had inclination but that's when they really became aware of the abuse that i was suffering so fast forward um my i was married to this guy for four months wow four okay. months but i i was dating him for at least a year and a half before and it started off as a slap but it got worse and worse and worse because he knew I had to depend on him for livelihood. So we were together. Um, so I became subject to whatever he administered. Wow. Um, so I'll fast forward to the last, um, last assault. And it's when my daughter was supposed to get christened. And I almost found a way to get out of the apartment that we were living in. And he held my daughter over the balcony and said, if I go out the door, she goes over the balcony. Wow. Um, and because I was so imprisoned with what he said, I, I believed that this was going to happen. Um, I came in, he put the baby on the couch and beat me. There was blood everywhere. Luckily, my dad had a business and um, the gentleman that lived above us, Mr. Bennett, called. So my dad came over with um, a weapon. <laughs> uh, and, and my, yeah, and my brother came over with a baseball bat. And I remember the police said, uh, Mr. Bur Burnett, don't get in trouble for this man. And they found him hiding in the garbage chute, which wow. was very appropriate. That's where he should have been. Well, listen. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, that was, and then they took him to jail because he was a landed immigrant. Okay. Um, and the laws changed at that time because normally when he would hit me, the police would come. I'm like, no, no, we're going to get back together wow. and, and fine. And he used to abuse me in public, rip my clothes wow. off at clubs. And like, I had, was embarrassed all over town. So this was the year that the laws changed and the police, if they saw the assault that they, they could charge. Okay. And that's the only reason that he was taken away because usually when the police come, I'm just like, no, there's nothing going on. I'm fine. Well, how did you hurt your face? I'm fell or, you know, some stupid excuse. So the police charged him, took him to um, jail and he was in jail. And then when he came out, I, I was free trying to formulate my own thoughts again, trying experiencing freedom as I knew it, but still being careless with my life. Um, and then I went to, uh, they, they, he had a court hearing, uh, no, sorry, immigration hearing. So he told, the, he told me that if I don't say we're going back together, that he, um, he'll, he'll basically beat me. He had an order of protection, but I had to be there at the hearing to right. confirm that, that we weren't getting back together. Right. So they said, are you getting back together? And I said, yes. Wow. And the lady looked at me and she said, are you sure about that? And I said, yes. Wow. So, yeah. So he, he left and went to a friend's house. I went right back upstairs and I said, he made me say that I don't want to get back together. Blah, 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 blah. And then they arrested him and he was taken across the border. So that's that was my freedom, but I still was not free in the mind because I still had abuses psychological. Right. Uh, right. You, you start to believe that you don't deserve better. Uh, so you either try and control your next situation. Okay. And that's 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 where I transgressioned and I I just made a whole slew of bad choices. Um, yeah, I just made a whole slew of bad choices. Wow. That, wow. That I, just, I just know that God's hand was on my life. Oh, absolutely. Because um, first, when he was choking you, when, you, when your father walked in to, to pull him off, that could have been ugly. Um, yeah, that could have been ugly. The fact that, you know, God had the angel upstairs to call your pops so, the, <laughs> so, so he can come over with the Thule and the, and, the, and, and the brother with the baseball bat. You know, yeah. that, that's divine intervention. And then... <laughs> What, 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 what I have to give you credit for is that you had the sense to go upstairs and say, no, he made me say that. Because if well, you I, had, I had to, because I knew that if I got back into the relationship with him, it would have been over. Mind you, my mom's mom, you know, in, in a Jamaican family, when something goes wrong, the whole 
the whole tribe knows about right. it, right? right? So my aunts came down and I remember one aunt said to me, um, how you let this continue to happen to you? And it's, you know, I don't blame her for it because that's, that's what they thought. And she's like, every man has to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't get it when he's awake you get it when he's sleeping so that's that's you know that's my family when when, when they pull together they pull together right, right. you know we could be separate but when there's a tragedy um they pull together um so yeah i i uh, and and it was it was a collective effort of everybody trying to make sure i was okay and i still didn't accept that uh, it took me at least a good seven to 10 years before I even wow. got rid of some of the fog and I started to make little steps into reclaiming my life as I knew it or trying to identify who I am as a person. Okay, so the question I have now is, do you think that the situation that happened as a young, as a young girl mm -hmm. had anything to do with allowing the abuse as an adult? Absolutely. Okay. I really do. I really think because I, there, there's no boundaries. Um, I didn't have boundaries. I didn't put boundaries around myself. Um, I allowed somebody to, I, I felt small from what happened. So I continued to allow somebody to treat me how they felt I deserve to be treated. Right. So I basically had the psychology of, okay, this is, this is, this is what I deserve. I put myself into it. And then you become a prisoner of your own thoughts. Right. And then he and then you become a prisoner of your own world, um, because the isolation allows that to happen. Where, 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 did, where did you live at when you when all this was going on? I was in London, Ontario. Okay. Okay. So still in Canada. Still in Canada. Still in Canada. When he got deported, what, what did he get deported to? Like Jamaica or? No, no. He's he was American. Oh. He's a, okay. He was a, he was in he's in the Michigan. Okay. All right, right over the border. Okay, no problem. Um, that, that's 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 fascinating. That's very fascinating. So, what made you take the poem and say, "Hey, let me make this a stage play"? Like, take us through that process. Well, I started. I got an opportunity in my church. I started attending church um, here and there, sprinkled here and there. Um, you know, taking what I wanted, what worked, and then finally. Um, to take you there, I have to tell you that I got, I met a guy when I was in Toronto, who's my current husband, Derek. Um, and he, he, I was always standoffish because I, I needed to control everything and every person around me to ensure that I would not get hurt. That's a position I started to take after the abuse. So I made sure I was going to hurt you before you hurt me. Okay. Um, so my language was, to other people, I, I said whatever came to, to the top of my tongue because I didn't care. And if you couldn't stand it, so be it. So when I met uh, my husband, Derek, he saw my flaws, but he also saw my wall. Okay. And he's like, and he's from the States. And he said, um, I know that you are trying not, you're putting up this wall so you don't get to know me. And he goes, I'm going to be right here nice. until, and you can talk to me about everything. And, and he really was the only guy that really took the time to understand what I was going through. And I tested him. I tested him like badly. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm surprised that he stuck around in those early days because it was, I was still a hurt person. I, I didn't right. process everything. But then when I told him everything about my past, um, when, when our relationship grew and I told him everything about my past and everything I did, like I didn't leave any stone unturned. He knows right. everything about me, everything I've done. And he still respected me and he still treated me like I was his number one. And it was only through that environment that that nurturing allowed right. me to feel, okay, it's, it's okay to feel vulnerable. It's okay to, it's okay to speak the truth to the situation. Right. And so with that freedom, um, cause he went to church as well. We started to attend church. We got married. I moved to the States. We attended a church and I started to do productions. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not schooled in writing, but I've always loved English. 
Okay. But I, I enjoy seeing words come to life and manipulating words to give it, you know, three or four meetings and bring it alive through art and entwine music and, and dance and, you know, and song. And that's what I did. So I, this lady came to the church, she was a VP of Disney. And she said, your plays are like um, mini Broadway plays and you need to do this for, you need to do this. And okay. I'm just like, okay, all right. But how am I gonna do that? And then my dad came down and he, you know, anything my dad says that I can do, it's just like, yeah, I can do it. If he says it, then I can do it. Okay. So I, I, I believed in myself. So I ventured out and I said, I'm gonna write a play. But I don't like to write just to write. Um, some people love to write, they can write stories, they can write a lot of fiction and whatever. I like to write where I'm, I'm imparting something to the audience. There's a lesson here, there's a call to action. So I decided, why don't I write about my life story so people understand who I am, right? So I started writing this very surface play and then the thoughts got deeper right. and deeper and then I remembered, oh, I wrote that play, The Wounded Soul. And as soon as I put that in, everything came out. Okay. Um, and it was just right before the Me Too movement. Wow. It was right before the Me Too movement. And mm -hmm. so when it was released, it was right, it, the, the play was right in line with the Me Too movement. So it was a timely play. Okay. And so that I know that God's hand was on the timing. It was. Because that opened up so many doors for me just because of the timing alone right and then that's when I decided that I got to continue this um, and champion this um, cause and help other women and so then I developed the Women's Worth Awards okay good we're going to put a pin in that because we're going to come back to the Women's Worth Awards <laughs> that's incredible. Um, but I have a question for you go ahead um, Derek did an amazing thing right most people don't understand, right, that to love someone, you have to be willing to take the BS, yes. right? You have to be willing to go through the weeds and and kind of figure out, is, is this a purposeful thing? Like, are you purposeful, purposefully, I, whatever that word is. Purposely, I yes, yes, I get those two buttons, don't worry about it. it. <laughs> You don't like each other. Yeah. So is is it is 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 it is it this thing that I don't want to get to know you, so don't get close to me for real, or I have this boundaries up because there's pain back here, and I'm afraid that you're going to see it and reject me, right? So what he did was he 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 stood by his word. He said, "I'm going to be right here." That's what he that, said. That, that's awesome, right? And, and I know your husband. You know, we talked last week, so he, he's an amazing guy. But, but the question that came to me while you were saying that, how would you compare, and I'm not actually, your dad to Derek? Um, okay, so there's no comparison. There's just differences, right? Because my dad is a strong Jamaican man who comes, um, his heritage is important. It's important to be strong. So he formulated that foundation where strength was, you know, not to say weakness wasn't a good thing, but we saw more of a, a presentation of strength. Right. Um, the Jamaican culture is a very prideful culture. We right. are strong people. We don't break, we don't do this. So me doing what I did um, to tell Derek everything was totally against cultural norms. Right. So Derek was, Derek is, an attentive man. Um, he's he's the opposite of my father, but the same in some manners. Right. Oppo opposite in the fact that he is he's not tied to um, tears reflecting weakness. Right. Um, right. Derek is a strong. He'll stand by me, but he'll always try and be the mediator. He's okay. a mediator. I'm right. the gun. I'm the, I'm the gun. He's the mediator. He's exactly what I need. Okay. Because I cannot have somebody like me right. in a relationship and expect to go further because we'd be like this. Okay. So he, bal he balances. He's exactly what 
I need it. And he saw, he, he saw the pain. He goes, I know you've been through a lot. And when you're ready to talk to me about it, I'm going to be right here. I'm not going anywhere. And I tested him because I wanted to show that there's no man that's going to stay around me, right? I already wrote my script of my life of what's going to happen. I think my sister and I were even talking about buying a house in Florida and, and retiring together. That like my life was already planned out. So he was an interruption. Um, and when then he came over, um, my daughter was there too, because this was the first time she was going to meet him. Okay. And so I said, my daughter's name Cheryl as well. And um, <laughs> she saw him and I said, okay, when he comes over, you stay in the living room, you will just talk and eventually he'll go away, right? So Derek came in, I get introduced there. This is my daughter, whatever. She calls me upstairs. She's like, mom, I'm going to my friend's. You go downstairs and you get to know that guy because I like him. And then she left. Nice. So I was stuck to really have a conversation because I used I used her as a diversion, right. not to connect. Right. Um, I, I, I always had a reason not to connect with someone. And it was okay because it was safer. Right. So this space was uncomfortable for me. And so I put him through another test. My family was having a barbecue. Uh, when my family has a barbecue, it's not like... 10 people, it's like 300 people, but I didn't tell him that. I said, they're having a barbecue, <laughs> Let, let's just go. Because I was trying to get somebody to validate in my mind that this is not really a good guy. Right. So he went to the barbecue and everybody loved him and it made me mad because I, I there was no, they didn't, Derek is a very easy person to, to love and care for very soft-spoken um and he gets along with anyone and they saw that and they loved him and i was like okay so let me just let me just give it a try and, and, and even when i tried i pulled back but he was still there and, and he got it one day he we, i just let it all out and it was just like it was a weight nice. it was a weight nice that is awesome that's an awesome story that is fantastic um so what have you learned uh, in your life? What, like at this point right now, the first thing that comes to mind, what have you learned about life? Um, that there's lessons in everything. There's lessons in uh, every, yeah, that just, I just learned that life is unpredictable, but I can, uh, what, what I do now is so much, much more important of what I did back then um yeah life is you you have to make your life you have to invest in yourself in self-development um and 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 make your life what you want it to be but you can't do that by yourself your will can only go so far right, right. you need another source yeah yeah and and you know from the outside looking in you, you you're right you guys do balance out yourselves very well I, I do admire the way you guys do what you do. Um, so let's let's fast forward a little bit. Um, so you you wrote a, you wrote another play. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> tell us tell us how that one came about. Well, I I was listening to um, Kirk Franklin's um, album, and I was inspired because what he was saying is exactly what I was experiencing. And, and, and what I was experiencing is the hypocrisy in the church, uh, the philosophies, um, the man-made rules, and then what they were calling things biblical. Right. Um, and I wanted to write about that and it gets exposed some behaviors and attitudes that are in the church that people don't want to talk about. Because I think, I believe, truly believe that that's why the church is shrinking because they're not recognizing that they can't live in four walls. They have to live outside the four walls because yeah. you're, you're not called to the world to save each other within the walls. The people that are already saved, you're called to save the world. Right. So I want to, you know, and it, you know, a lot of, I got, I really got, I got about two or three nasty notes from somebody, you know, on Facebook, you know, Facebook, we have all these, yeah. these people yeah. that are the, they have a doctrine in and what life is supposed to be. And I said, well, before you start criticizing, why don't you try to understand what I'm writing about? I'm not saying lose religion, like lose God. I'm like embrace the relationship, lose the rules because Christianity is a simple, simple 
notion to take on. Man has complicated. You can't right. do this. You can't wear lipstick. You can't do this. You can't do this. It, that's not what it says in the Bible. Nowhere in my Bible does it say that. Right. So I just wanted to um, unveil the hypocrisies and have people question their thoughts and their attitudes because I think at times Christians can be the very weak, can be the weakest people. And I say that respectively because the world is louder than the Christians. Mm -hmm. We sit back and, you know, we see things wrong and I'll, I'll just pray about it. No action. Unless you're Trump supporter. Yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 you have to, you got to pray and act. And I think yeah. as some, as Christians, we can use prayer as a crutch not to do anything. We'll just pray. God will do this. God will do this. God, God gave you a mind. Right. He gave you the freedom of choice. Right. Um, if he wanted to implement everything and not give you choice, he wouldn't have given you a brain. He would have just fed you the Holy Spirit and say, move to the left, move to the right. But he gave mm -hmm. us, he gave us choices. So I just wanted people to try and just question their attitudes, question their walk with the Lord and make sure that what they're following is actually in the Bible. You have to know the word of, of God. I've just, I've just started, I, sh I should say started within the last seven years, seven to, no, sorry, eight to 10 years. I've got to know God as I know, not who somebody told me he is. Right. Right. I have to, I had to read on my own and ask for the wisdom and ask for the discernment of what the message you're trying to show me. And, and they've always been timely, my meditations. I don't start any day without meditating in the morning. Like right. my work knows that I'm not going to start work until I've done my medication because you don't want the girl that shows up without the prayer and the meditation and I need to be prepared in the morning so I'm very I'm very serious with my time in the morning so I meditate and I read and I write the first hour that I get up I don't even sleep with my phone beside me anymore because I used to wake up and just you know right. that scroll and then all of a sudden it's half an hour you wasted your life Love trying to find out what everybody else is doing when you should be doing something with your life. Love so, yeah, um, I say all that to say, to circle back to you and say that losing my religion was very important for me to, to state that it's about losing the man-made rules and embr embracing the relationship with Christ and not just um, saying, you know, you have to have your skirt down to here. You can't do that. I, I, it, those things bother me because it, it's, it's just, it's, those are legalistic. Right. Um, do you want to give them a, a, a kind of broad synopsis of what, because people listening right now, they're like, well, well what's the play about? Uh, you know, she's just saying, you know, the rules. Can you like give them like the, the kind of a, a little bit of the storyline? <laughs> So, so the storyline is about um, well, this, the 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 storyline is about people judging people just on the exterior, not getting to know them. And, and that's my that was my whole. If I could change the world, I would change the prejudices. But I wanted to, to present the current religious practices and what are contrary to the Word of God. So mm -hmm. I presented, you know, a deacon in the church and this a street guy and everybody's attention was on the guy from the streets because everybody worshiped the preacher and the deacon because they were in a position of honor and didn't question their bad judgment so i wanted to show the hypocrisy in you can't idle man right because they're with flaws all men pastors too um and so we can't the bible says to we're not supposed to sit back we judge not we're supposed to judge the sin, not the person. Right. right. So I, I was just trying to the judge judgment free zone, embrace the person, get to know the person, right. but quest make sure and, and it's a it's not even about questioning spiritual authority. When you know that something is contrary to the word, we have to say it's contrary to the word. Right. I'm not a silent person that you can feed me and I'm just amen, amen to everything you say. Right. I have to, it has to digest. And I I'll say, I don't, I don't recall the Bible saying that. So I'll, I'll go and look it up and then, okay, yeah, that was said, but right. I'm not, can I get an amen? No, you can't get an amen. Right. I, I need to look this up because amen solidifies that 
I agree with you. And I, I you know, I, you have to be very intentional about your mindset. Um, so it's about intentionality, being aware and questioning respectfully. I'm not saying you go to church and you can disrespect the pastor, but I'm just saying you use, use your God given discernment to right. make wise church uh, choices. And if something's not right, don't just sit there and say, God will deal with it. Um, it's, we can't we can't do that we can't yeah, be no, you're there for a reason you're there to to have that honest tough conversation you should be able to walk up to your pastor and go hey you said xyz and and and, and, and i'm not clear of what that means um, right. i haven't seen that in the bible before could you could you take me through that and if right. you go to your pastor four or five times and he tells you you know just do what i tell you to do then you you need to you know <laughs> and we, we experienced that, right? We experienced that. I didn't, I didn't write, I, I wrote from, I can only write on things that I experienced because that's how it comes across as authentic. So right. when people ask me, what am I going to write on next? I don't, I don't know. I don't write just to write. I write because I want to make impact. But that happened to us. We were in a church and we, we stated something. And then all of a sudden we got all, everybody, all the leaders had to take a spiritual authority class. Wow. And I, and I questioned it, you know, I was the only one that was asking questions. And so, you know, it was taboo. So, you know, start to get the red velvet treatment, the red rope, vel the red, red vel velvet rope treatment where, you know, I can only come within a certain distance wow. of the pastor. Then he goes left because he doesn't want to talk to me or answer my question. So when you see attitudes like that, if someone can't have a conversation with you and address, and then they collectively try to address the crowd and speak to you without speaking to you, like right. make the message a sermon directed to one person, that's that to me is a sin because a pastor should always make sure the message he's presenting is speaking to him first because he's still a man and he's got to present that from a position that he's mm -hmm. human. He's not above what God says. And he's not this overly angelic. Every man has flaws, pastor, doctor, every, every person has a flaw. Absolutely. When you're in that pulpit, that lesson, uh, and I've said this a thousand times, when, when, when I'm preaching, I am, that message is actually for me. If you right. something from it, then that's fine. God was dealing with me when I wrote this. Right. So however you get it, then, then, then come along and, and work your thing out with you. But, and, and, and I've heard um, since then, um, I've, I've made that declaration. A lot of other people say the same thing. Like this, this, this word was for me. Like, and some people say, say, hey, Tony, I tried to change the word, but you see how, if you, if you listen to what I came out with and what I ended up with, cause God wanted me to go here and I was trying to go somewhere else. You know, so, so that, so that is very important as well. That's it's, very important. it's important. And I, let me just slide this in before you move on. Is that the, the church that I attend to now the pastor makes sure that his humanness is always presented. He doesn't take the position that I'm up here and you're down here. He's all, he can be, he's at the altar. He admits his faults. He admits his, the thoughts that are out of line with the Bible. So we always see him as a man and right. not this person that we're supposed to worship. And I really respect that because I think it's needed in this, this, this environment that we're in that people need to understand that, you know, you don't have to be, there's no perfect Christian, right. there's nope. no perfect pastor. Nope. Um, and we're all imperfect, um, trying to obtain perfection unsuccessfully. Right. So nope. it, it's the, that's just the way it is. There's no perfect person. Right. Exactly. My pastor's the same way. Um, he, he'll tell you, uh, I'm, I, it, I might be the pastor, but this is not my church. This is our church. Right. I'm, my position does not, not make me higher than the usher or higher than the person in the pew that sits in the back in the corner. My position does not do that for me. I'm not higher than anyone else. He'll humbly give everything he has before he takes. So, you know, we, we are both shepherded by uh, very, very strong people. Um, so let's go. We, we, we've covered to two place. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've, uh, you've just come out with a book mm -hmm. um, and you've. What was the title of that again? I call the book The Restored Soul okay. because the play was The Wounded Soul, but I I did not want to stay in the pain and the title still reveals the pain. Right. And so I want to present a position of healing. So I called it The Restored Soul. It's just the rebirth of The Wounded Soul. All right, great. 
Great, 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 fantastic. Um, so I've got to get my copy of that, and it has to be signed, of course. You know, it's right here. After COVID, you can come and get it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. All right. So before we jump into the boardroom, all right, okay, because we're really going through this this journey of yours. That's incredible. Um, I'm learning a lot more about you than I, than I already know, and giving me even more respect for you. Um, the award that you do once a year. Um, I, I went to the first one um, a year and about a year and a half ago, I think. So that you went to the second one. Oh, you, maybe it was the first one. I don't remember. No, you're right. It was the second one. It was the second one. No, it was, the, right. second one. It was the second one. Because it was at the uh, the the, the manor, the other <laughs> place that you've that you've broken grounds and grounds. Okay. So that's something else we'll get into in a second. Okay. So, what made you put that particular award together? And what's the name of it again? It's called the A Woman's Worth Awards. Okay. So I wanted to, and, and as I said, after I wrote The Wounded Soul, I had a lot of feedback from people who said, you know, I got to keep going. I got I got to, you know, I, I got to keep telling the story. But I just felt that I had to um, honor people who told me their stories and came out of it. And they're still um, reaching back to help someone else because, you know, your story is not for you. Your story is to help someone else. Yeah. So I laid in bed and... Um, I think the next day I said, Derek, I, at two o'clock in the morning, I woke up and said, like, Derek, Derek, I, I know I have got this revelation. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And that's exactly what I did. And the first year it sold out. Year one and year three sold out. Year two was, it was, it was, it was a, a, a well attended. But um, the award was based on women who've come through, who have overcome some kind of, difficulty or challenging time in their life but the main part of this is that they're reaching back to help someone else okay. so I hold I host a nomination process which normally takes place in December and January of the year but because of COVID I'm postponing it and I'm probably going to do something closer to um, uh, July and August this year um, just so people feel more comfortable the comfort level is right. it's probably a little strained right now and then I create, uh, I have judges with a certain criteria of, you know, the value add, how long they've been doing the backstory, what they're doing now, et cetera. Uh, and then we, they, we have a grading system and we accumulate the grading system and then we contact those award, the nominees. And the first year I didn't, um, everybody that was nominated was invited because I didn't want people to come I didn't want women to come to the award show only because they knew they want to get a reward. Right. Okay. So I was trying to create a culture of it's okay to cheer somebody else on, even if you don't win, because we all have the same goals. We've, we have similar experiences. Right. Um, we've overcome, we're overcomers. So why not celebrate each other? So that was the impetus for the first year. The second year, I, I kind of changed that model and, um, I notified the the winners and that the last year winners present to the next year letters because I'm trying to create the legacy. Right. Uh, whoever wins this year, next year they'll they'll uh, present to the, the the following year recipients. Okay, um, how how many how many different awards do you have? Because because you, you you how many? All right, I think the time that I was there, uh, at least five or six women got an award. Yeah, so I had eight, I have eight awards. Okay. Uh, um, and they, I had different categories, silence breaker, wave maker. Um, uh, that, that was the first year. But because the criteria, when we, when we did all that, they kind of meshed together. And I have two youth awards, Young Achiever and one for one that's very instrumental in music because music is um, part of my creative um, atmosphere. Um, so the next year we decided to take away the categories and just give out eight awards with people who reach these criteria. So now it's it's just, it's eight awards. And then I have a EVP Renaissance woman, which is a woman that stands out. And, and it's kind of, um, I wanna be careful to say that they're doing more than the other people are doing. It, uh, it's, 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 it's just a, it's just the criteria we've gone through, the impact that the, the woman has done, the amount of years they've been there, 
Um, so there's not one that really stands out. Like I've cried with all of the testimonies that we've heard. Um, writing them down on paper for somebody nominating, it's only until the person tells their stories that you realize how, how, how amazing and, and what they've overcome. And so if you create this community of, of we're here to support each other and it's it it just keeps getting bigger and 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 bigger and and it's not even the size because even if if 10 people came that would be enough for me because the message for me is the support and the acknowledgement of these women not that they need to be acknowledged but i just wanted my main thing is i never want someone to feel like they're walking through something alone yeah um one of the uh the award winners for me the year that I was there was the young lady who followed a guy, she got pregnant, her mother kicked her out. She was homeless for, I don't know, a good four or five years, going yeah. through these shelters and everything. And then she just met a guy, I know she turned herself around, then met a guy who, who, who was greatly supported her. And then she turned around and started going back to all the people that was in shelters and doing her work. And I was like, my God, like just, just the impact that she's making and from where she came from, from where she came from, like she had nothing, like everybody turned their back on her, her family, her friends. And she had to really go through it by herself with this child going on. And then, then, then for her to really turn her life around and, and get, and, and then turn around and give back which yes. you have to just I, I was blown. I was absolutely blown away. Um, so let's let's do this real quick. How can people um, how can people get involved? Like how can people? I guess we'll put your 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 your, your contact information up later. But how else can people get involved? As far as say, I, I know a woman that I want to have nominated. How would I go? How how would you person go about doing that? They can send, uh, I have a AWW, a, AWW, a woman's worth awards.org website where the nomination form is there. They, they can do that or they can send me an email um, with the woman that they're nominating. We can reach out to the people that they nominate to get some more information. And then I proceed and, and, and put it through the judge processes. And mind you, there's been people that try to be a little slick Rick and, um, <laughs> It, it, I, I, it happens in everything, but we, we try and really do a, 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 a vetting process to in, ensure that who the person is. It's not about, some people like to have the awards just to have the name, but it, it's about making sure that who they are and who what they've done is who they, that is what, who they say they've been. Okay. I, I see, but you, uh, a couple of minutes ago, you snuck in uh, where else were we going? You said EVP. Could you explain people what that is? Oh, and EVP, EVP is Endless Voice Productions. And that's the umbrella by which all of my, it's a theater productions and events um, company where, uh, it, and, and it's called Endless Voice Productions because to me, the voice is endless in, in what you present. People can, voice can be song, can be poetry, could be dance, could be art, drawing. Uh, there's the voice is endless on how it's portrayed. So I encompass in in my work when I do plays, I write music to the 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 the, the soundtracks, and um, I incorporate dance. I got dance instructors to make dance routines. So I like to encompass all elements of art because different things connect with people different ways, and I and I just want the endless uh, community of voices to be, you know, heard. Okay. And, Nice. Um, what else do you do though? Because you, you kind of got some other things going on in that production company over there. What what uh, what else am I doing? Yeah, what else is going on? Because I remember, you know, when we was doing the play, uh, losing my religion. There was there was a young man who was very talented on singing and 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 his vocals and uh, playing the piano. Oh, okay. So that's Caleb. Caleb is uh, is somebody I always have in my back pocket. He's a he's a very creative and uh, he's he's just a very talented young man. Um, there, I don't know. I'm I'm not managing him. If that's what you're getting into, okay. I don't I don't I don't manage people. 
I don't manage people. It's, it's hard to manage people, especially if they're not as motivated as you. Um, yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a go-getter and it's hard for me to push people when they don't see the vision too or somebody thinks that things should be easy. Uh, so I've, I've kind of pulled back from that. I used to do that years ago, manage artists. I don't. But what's in the scope right now, The Wounded Soul is in film production. Oh, nice. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's it's going to, uh, the filming is going to be next, this year, sorry, okay. in, in, in California. And um, we just finished all the proposals and numbers or whatnot. So I hope the release date should be closer to the end of uh yes by september october i have a really great producer kendra mcdonald and she's she's awesome she's won some awards doing um some films in california and i i met her years ago and we stay connected so i just think god is just maneuvering the pieces together so she's been very helpful and carrying helping me carry the vision forward right nice. uh, so stay tuned and watch for us to what Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> the, big, the big or or small screen were coming. We're definitely yeah. I just want the message to you know it's a way to you just the theater is great, but to reach so many people, you're limited. And if there's right. any way we can get the message out and 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 show that God is a redeemer, He's a restorer. Right. That's that that's my message. This is my this is my way of ministering. Okay. It's a great way of ministering because uh, you're touching a lot of people. Um, so we spoke before before uh, we, we, we took this thing on, and I told you uh, the first title that came to me is um, From Domestic Violence to the Boardroom. So now let's go back to what you do uh, okay. so people can understand how we got to the boardroom part because you own your own company. Uh, you, you run a um, very successful award uh, ceremony for, for, for people, uh, for young ladies to give back and, and, and who've been through things, that's awesome. Um, so before we go to the boardroom, cause we gotta back up, cause I, I skipped over one thing. Okay. So there's a place in Pelham, Pelham, Westchester, Pelham, right? Yes. And that place is in, in Westchester is predominantly Caucasian, right? Yeah. And the Pelham, uh, location has been around, Pelham Manor has been around for 122 years. Yes. So when people ask me about racism, and this has nothing to do with Pelham Manor, um, this, I'm just talking about racism in general, they go, well, racism doesn't exist. And I will always go, then why is there a first black? This, that, okay. another? Why yeah. is why are we still having the first black something or, or another? Or why are we right. having the first woman something or another? So tell them after 122 years, what you are the first black. And the first black board member at uh, the, the Manor Club. And, it, it, and I, it's an honor because, you know, they, they thought that they were, they're getting, you know, and rightfully so, they probably thought that I was a really good fit, but I learned a lot from them as well. I always seek to learn and it's, I, cultures to me is, you know, I grew up a, a, around different races, cultures. So it's, it's, it's very important for me to embrace other people. So when they embrace me, they embrace me because I had the event at their place right. and they liked how I put, presented excellence. Black excellence is out there right. and it, it exists. So I was honored that they asked me to be a member of the board. So I've been on the board for, I think this is going on to my third year. Nice, nice, nice. Absolutely. Oh, we forgot something else. You have something else uh, in the works that um, will help people relax as they do their morning uh, meditation. Oh, right. So, yes. You okay. was, you <laughs> was to slide through that one, huh? So, yeah, as, as in the evol, I always try and find ways that I can not even stay relevant, but things that um, mimic what I'm trying to the message that I'm trying to portray. So I started my own aromatherapy line called Truce. And I called it Truce because I want to say to people, stop having con conflicts within yourself. Call it Truce, relax. And, and they're scented candles and they're diffusers. Nice. Um, and and, and that's, that line is doing really well too. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy 
with how that's going. And I, and I see opportunities opening for that too. Nice, nice. So um, I don't know, I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, what's up with the ginger beer, yo? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, so we, we, we had, we, Derek and I made this really great ginger beer that was really awesome. But the only thing we had to just pull back on that because the licensing and stuff was a little bit more difficult to get. So we have to rethink that and rework it a bit, but we, it's something in the back burner that we're going to bring forward again. Um, not in the immediate year, not this right. year. I'm sorry, but if you come over, I will definitely make some for you. Uh, but market-wise, probably it, that's not something on t uh, for our vision until 2020, 2022. Okay. Okay, great. So let's go, all right, to, to, to the landing uh, base is where you get to the boardroom. Okay, you have your own company. We could actually stop right here because all the things that you just mentioned, um, you have your own company. Um, you have this fragrance, you have a movie coming out. My gosh, like you, you're nonstop. That's, 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 that's what we just spoke about. It's normally somebody's whole day. But inside that, you are also have a nine to five that is just as taxing. And it's, and it, and it, and it has a, and it has a broad scope to handle things that need to be handled and stamped and stamped. So it's not like you just go to work and, you know, chatter, 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 things are happening. So if you want to just briefly go through, through that of, of why we landed on the boardroom. I, I, I have been blessed. I, I, I would, and, I, and, and that's what I, I'll say. I was blessed when I was, I've worked for many of the fortune 500 companies. And so my life is very, is, is an antithesis of what it should really be. I remember when I got the job at, I used to work for Time Warner uh, and I sat in the office and I looked out the window, looking at the water and I started laughing because I couldn't believe that a door got open for me to get there. And from there, doors have opened for me. So I know that God is using me for something greater. Um, and from there, I worked at another Fortune 5. I currently work for uh, Deloitte, uh, which is one of the top four professional companies. And I'm the manager for the contract corporate governance. And they just asked me to be to lead the diversity, equity, and wow. inclusion um, uh, division of uh, the procurement. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities opening for me there. But I, I, I want to ensure that I don't lose focus of where I think I'm going to make my greatest impact. And, and that is uh, my still, they, they, they even um, circulated my book. Uh, right. They allowed me to speak about the book. So I, I really appreciate that uh, uh, about uh, Deloitte. They, very, they embrace the, the, the well-being is what they call it and the resilient spirit. So I, I, I'm really blessed that they helped me along that way. So I work at Deloitte. Um, I'm on the board of Pelham. I have my businesses. I started the Biz Circle in COVID to help uh, business owners and uh, entrepreneurs find a as a business resource hub to be to have access to subject matter expertise or people with experience with certain topical business areas that would help them grow their business. Because if you're not growing in your business or you're not growing as a person, you're just, you're stagnant and, and you're not branching out. So I always look for opportunities where I can encourage other and serve. Okay, so yeah, let's, let's talk about that for a second because I, I see it with all the posts um, of your business stuff. Is there, is there a fee to join that or? There's a, there's not a fee to join uh, if unless you want to be a premium member. And a premium member, there's additional benefits, which, is, which are one-on-ones with the subject matter expertise okay. I'm offering. There was one course offering, a free course offering, um, and there's just little... Um, little bonuses it's it's very de minimis uh, price it's just 25 dollars for the year not a month for the right. year right. and the reason i put that price there is because people are more amped to participate in something when they invest in something yeah. uh, so i really try and champion the idea that it's not a numbers game for me i'm not one of the people that wants to have four thousand people in the group 
I'm looking for people who are committed to supporting each other and growing. And, and, and I'm not looking for people who only want to post about their business or only think that uh, the platform is just for them. It's, it's, it's reciprocated. Um, that's about business. That's how business should be. It's about building the relationship and it's not about self-promotion. So that's what I, I've deleted posts that of people that just come there and post and they don't engage because that, I, I really want to create that culture of community. Yeah. And, and I've, like I said, I've seen a lot of different posts come through there and a lot of good uh, content, a lot of good information, useful, useful information for people who are starting businesses and trying to grow their business. And I see that um, you're, 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 you're always advertising someone doing something. And, you know, I, I got to give you kudos for that as well. Um, I also got to give you kudos for the uh, the Daniel Fast when you when you bring up uh, start of the year. Um, so, you, you, like you said, you are extremely intentional, um, and I deeply appreciate that. You know, I deeply appreciate that uh, that that you you carry yourself in a certain manner of respect. You know what I mean? So, when someone hears your story, right, and because you because you snuck in there that your sister made you go back to school. Okay. Well, she, I didn't say, I, I shouldn't say made. She just talked to me and said, you know, what does your future look like, basically? Right. Where are you going? And, and, and she's not one to tell you what to do. She'll just drop hints on what you're not doing. And then, you know, our family talks in parables all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, so you, you figure it out along the way, right? <laughs> so... Uh, so I got the message and then I became a schoolaholic. Like I, I, I just kept going to school. And if I could be in school for the rest of my life, I would, because I'm a knowledge hoarder. I love to know about a little bit about everything from everybody. Every day I, I, I purpose to learn from someone. What, what, what made me know that you were, that, that I already knew you were intelligent. When I knew you were very about, about your knowledge, I tried to be slick and I was like, so what's the uh, original name of Africa? What did you say? I don't remember. What did I say? You said the name, Kowalabin. Did I say that? Yes, you did. You told, yes. I, was, I was like, okay. I have, I, I have, I have senior moments. I, you remember, I'm, I'm your senior. I'm your senior now. I was, <laughs> you're not my senior. You might be a senior. You're not <laughs> So, you know, um, this has been a pleasure. Um, I, I don't know what else, um, but just to continue to give you kudos um, because you are doing amazing work. Like well, for people to understand where you came from, what you went through to turn around and give so much back. Because when, when, when we, as we're talking, if people are really paying attention, you're creating and then giving. You're creating and then giving. You're not creating and taking. You know, this world that we live in now is a create and take. Right. Here, I created something, give me, give me, give me. Right. You're creating and giving here. This is, this is, this, this is a, the fact that when I can't get on social media, right? Without somebody telling me the quick way to make money and please send me, $18 a month, $50 a month, $80 a month so you can be involved in something. But here you have this platform to say, give me $25 for the year and I'll put you in contact with the people that's who, who, who's going to help you build your business. Right. I'm not doing that. No, I know. I know. And, it's, and, you, you know, and I'm not doing it to make money on that aspect. Right. I'm doing it to help the people. Right. Uh, and, and it's funny that uh, I just I'll say it quickly because I it's it's the mentality of social media is has created a, a me factor. It's all about me. Right. And people have forgotten that it's you still it's about building relationships. I, I learned about business from modeling my dad. He was in business for 37 years and he successfully ran that. And what was important to him were, was customer relation. He knew his customers right. by name and he made sure that every customer felt like they were the only customer. So when I say business relationship is important, school school is great for the knowledge, but right. there's nothing like real life experience and seeing it happen. So I know it works. And right. that's what I'm trying to embed into people is not about trying to just say, here, buy this, buy this, buy this what value are you going to add uh, in the process to make sure that this person feels like 
you really want them as a customer and a friend and not just a money uh, money bank. Right, exactly. So let me share my screen so people can see where to find you in one right. way. Okay, let's go here. Let's go there. Let's go up to here. So that's your book. Um, yes. Everybody, please write down uh, Cheryl's information on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and um, LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why that fell off my tongue. I'm, I'm and all and, yeah, and they're, and they're all at Cheryl Hatwood, um, except um, Twitter. Twitter. Twitter is Endless VP. Right, okay. Twitter is Endless VP. But you can connect with me anywhere from at www.cherylhatwood.com. Email me, and then I can lead you if you're interested in the Biz Circle or any of the products or the books, it's, it's you know, that's that's my main contact right there, CherylHatwood.com. Right. And absolutely, if, if they don't, um, if they want to jump into start buying this book right now, they can go to Amazon. And Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. Right, it's definitely there, Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. Um, I would be remiss if I did not do this. If you are suffering um, from domestic violence of any sort, um, Cheryl brought it up earlier tonight that domestic violence is not something that only happens to women, it happens to men as well. Um, when I looked at the numbers before this conversation, I literally had to go sit down for about a half an hour to 45 minutes and readjust myself to understand the gravity of what's going on. Um, if you are, if you need help, um, by all means, please go to the hotline.org. Uh, um, they have, as you can see, the screen will pop up just like this. They have a place you can call. If you don't wanna call and talk to somebody, you can do a live chat as well. Um, Cheryl, you're also involved, and we didn't bring this up, with, with a, a domestic violence organization as well. So if you wanna tell the audience how to get in touch with that, if, uh, those people as well, so. I'm a member of the National Correlation of Domestic Violence, and I'm also locally affiliated with uh, my sister's place of Westchester. So either 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 ones are really great resources. One, if, if you don't, the National Correlation Against Domestic Violence uh, supports women nationally. So that's a great resource. And the uh, my sister's place is in Westchester and, 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 and usually does the surrounding areas. But again, if you ever need help, uh, when I say that, I, I mean it, um, send me an email. I will hook you up to the resources that, that can connect you to a safe place or strategize legal fees, shelter. Um, please reach out, never feel like you're alone. So I will have a testimony for that one because um, in the middle of the year, uh, I got, a, I got a text that someone needed help. They was going through a domestic violence situation. They had to leave their house with their child and they had nothing. I reached out to Cheryl and said, hey, this is going on. She said, come by my house tomorrow. I came by the house the next day. She had clothes. She had uh, clothes for the child. She had a little something for the, for the, uh, for the, the, for the young lady. As, as well as encouragement. She said, you know, I gave her the phone number and, and they reached out. So this is not just lip service. She's about the work. She is about the work. So please um, don't let this go in vain. Uh, please reach out to her, reach out to these hotlines. And if you need the help, please let us, let us know and we will try to get you to where you need to be to get you the help that you need. There are people out here who want to help you who want to help you. It, it's, it's not a scam. It's not, you, you don't need to give anything. You just need to come willingly and say, I need help. And we will try to do as best as can to get you the help that you need. Cheryl, I love you to pieces. Uh, you, thank you, you for having me. Thank you. I, I so appreciate this conversation. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for putting me on your, on your extra, extra busy schedule. I really appreciate that. So have a fantastic day. And, uh, 